This morning, um, I'm going to digress from preaching Daniel, and I'm going to go do a totally different topic. I'm going to talk about being a servant. Being a servant. And so, throughout the scriptures, we find that word, being a servant, serve, servant, and so forth. And the word servant is used like 440, 41 times in, the, in all of the Bible. So when I was thinking about that, and as the Holy Spirit brought that to my mind, that's perhaps me what I should be covering today. I find that as I look at that, and the more I studied it this last week, I would have to admit myself even, I fall short. And I think we will all find ourselves falling short in serving, and serving as the Lord would want us to serve. But as you know well, the message that Reuben, Brother Reuben had here last Sunday, about the last times, the end times, Corny praying this morning, the world is getting darker. How important isn't it going to be in the last days, first of all, to be a servant, not of fellow man, but of God. A servant of God. In John chapter 12, verse 26, we'll just take one verse for now. John 12, 26. If any man serve me, let him follow me. Where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Isn't that a blessing, just that? If we serve God, the father will not forget about that. He will honor him. So the description of a servant may carry with it different meanings. Number one, first of all, a servant is someone who carries out the will of another. That's usually what we see as a servant, carrying out the will of another. Number two, to be a servant is to be loyal to his master, even, is, even if it is not convenient. To serve very often takes us out of our comfort zone, it takes us out of our warm place. It takes us someplace sometimes where we just don't feel we want to be. But it's those times when we feel that way that is where God is starting to bless us and encourage us and strengthen us. Number three, faithful servants never retire. Let me explain. You can retire from your career. You can retire from farming. You can retire from your business. But you can never retire from serving God. That is something that we need to do the rest, all of our lives. Serving God. And it may be in the smallest of capacities. I just read a, a newsletter from Voice of Martyrs this week. And in it was a man mentioned I'm not going to go into a lot of detail of the story. It's uh, too long for that this morning. His name was Bonzin, if, that, if I'm even pronouncing that right, because he was in the land of Laos, or, or country of Laos. This man is 101 years old. And he said this, if I could, I would still like to go to Bible school at 101 years old. My heart has just wanted to serve the Lord since I was 20 years old. Now I am tired physically. Note, I am tired physically, he says. But my heart is not tired of the work of the Lord or the Lord's work, he says. Even though the other man is perishing, yet the inward man, the Bible says, should be renewed 
on a constant basis. And we should be constantly renewing our heart and our soul and our mind from the scriptures. We perhaps know now what it all means to be a servant. It's carrying out the will of another. Yet not necessarily a slave, let me say. Slaves are forced to very often to do the master's will. A servant does it willingly. So what is a faithful servant? Our text words, opening the words, John 12, 26. If any man serve me, let him follow me where I am. There shall also my servant be, and my father will honor him. Colossians 3, 12 and 13, put it this way. Put on therefore, Colossians 3, 12 and 13. <coughs> put on therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. That to me sounds like when Paul tells to the Colossians, like almost like a perfect servant. As I said earlier, we will fall short. We do fall short. But the greatest servant through all scriptures is one we have all learned about. We have been taught that from our youth, perhaps, at, at home from, by our parents, perhaps in Sunday schools, youth groups, from the pastoral, and so forth. The greatest servant is who? It's Jesus Christ. Isaiah 53 describes him as a suffering servant. Jesus was in the perfect will of the Father. Philippians 2, 7, and 8, backing up just a chapter or two. Philippians 2, 7, and 8. But made of himself, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in the fashion as a man, what did he do? He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Jesus totally surrendered himself to the Father's will, and thereby being a servant. He even surrendered himself for the sake of us as mankind, that he would wash away our sins on the cross of Calvary dying a death that we deserved. That's the kind of servant that Jesus Christ was. But throughout scripture we also find many people who were called servants. Many of God's chosen people. We have Moses called the servant of the Lord in Deuteronomy 34, 5. And we have many others in and for the sake of time this morning, I'm not going to be able to get all the scriptures, but we have Joshua, Samson, David, Solomon, Joseph, Paul, and all the disciples of Jesus were servants to the Lord. And many others as well that were servants to the Lord. In Matthew 20, 25 through 27, And Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know the princes and Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall, be, it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Again, we have this word servant. We want to be great. We want to be leaders, chiefs, be a servant. 
But is that our culture today? We live in a culture in which most people are seeking their own interests. And if they have time, or if at any end, or if at the end of the day, they will be a servant if it helps to serve themselves. It's then they may consider serving someone else. By nature, we are selfish creatures. We are a people who desire praise. We desire honor. We want to be first in many things, and perhaps in most things even. And we enjoy being served. It may be harsh words, but that's kind of the society we are in today, being served. Go to the book of Matthew, chapter 10. Forty-two to forty-five. But Jesus called him them to him and saith unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever shall be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever shall be, will be the chiefest shall be a servant of all. For even the Son of Man came to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Let's give that a second thought. This passage gives us the principle and the thought that we see so many places in Scripture. We are to be servants. As we mentioned earlier, Jesus gave himself to be a ransom for most of us, for all of us, not just most, all. Let's go to Romans chapter 6. Verse 20. Romans 6, 23, if I say that, it's probably a familiar verse to all of us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through, our Lord, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that verse gets quoted often. It's part of the, of the salvation plan that we very often use. But let's go back to verse 20. For when you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye, ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit in, unto holiness and the end everlasting life. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And sometimes when we're taking a person through the plan of salvation, we often forget to mention verses 20, 21, and 22. You were a servant of sin. When you were servants of sin, you didn't have any righteousness in you. That was the furthest thing from your mind, to be serving God. And what kind of fruit did you have then in your life when you were serving sin? And for that matter, if you're even serving sin today, what kind of fruit does that bring you? In my day, before I came to Christ, the things I've done, I'm ashamed of. And some of those things come to haunt me even today. I know God has forgiven me, but Satan loves to throw them back at you continually. And if we stay in that sinful state... Romans here tells us it's death. 
is the spiritual death. But now, because of Jesus Christ, we're made free from sin and become servants of God. When we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we became servants of God. And we have fruit now unto holiness. We bear fruit that will guide and direct us in our lives. We bear fruit unto others as well. And others will see the fruit that's in us. And I'm sure you've all seen it and even it's been said to you as well. What has happened to that man or that woman? Look how he's changed. How his tongue has changed. How his ways of thinking have changed. There's fruit unto holiness. We continue walking in sin. It is death again, as 23 says. But we have that wonderful gift to those who want the gift of Jesus Christ dying on the cross of Calvary for our sins. So then this morning we might be asking, how do I follow Christ? How am I a servant and how can I be a servant? I would have to say this morning, I think there's an attitude that has to be developed to be a servant. This is perhaps the biggest barrier for all, all of us as mankind. As I said earlier, we're naturally selfish. Plus, we're saturated in this culture, in the Western world, about being me, myself, and I. You are God. The God is in you. Serve me. That's the kind of culture we're in today. But to get out of that idea of that culture, let's look at Philippians chapter 2, 3, and 4. Philippians 2, 3, and 4. Let nothing, nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. That's kind of a bitter pill for some of us, isn't it? To always be on the lookout for others, esteeming others better, For a long time, I carried a note in my Bible on top of this chapter and saying, Frank, esteem others better than yourself. How about if you had post that on your mirror in your bathroom? Every morning you'd get up and you look in the mirror. Today, Frank, you esteem others better than yourself. Add your own name into it. What might that look like at the end of the day for you? Because that's exactly what Jesus did, really. He esteemed others better than himself with the verses that we read already in Philippians 2, 7, and 8. He took the form of a servant. When he humbled himself, he became obedient to the point of death. See, the underlying, the underlying motivation, really, of being a servant is love. That's why Jesus was willing to give up his position of honor and glory in heaven. And he came to this earth. Well, you would say, as a humble babe, yes, you're totally right. But he came as a servant. Because of Jesus' great love for us, he was willing to die for us, to be a ransom for us. 
And because of Jesus' great love for us, and because of all that he's done on the cross of Calvary, should we not show the love that Jesus had for us? Show it to one another? And serve one another? All because God the Father sent his Son to be a servant for mankind. Galatians 5, 13 and 14, Paul said, Through love, served one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. If we truly love Jesus and truly love our brothers and sisters, then being a servant is much, much easier. In fact, we will want to serve. And even if our neighbor is one that's perhaps ungodly, we still will want to serve. We will still want to do them good. We still will want to show them the love of Christ. And may even be just with a cup of cold water but we will still want to do it for them. But it's not enough to just know what we need to do or how, how to be a servant or that we want to be a servant. We must actually serve. comes down to the, having an attitude of servanthood. We may even know what we need to do, but for selfish reasons, we sometimes don't. It is so easy, so often, to just make up an excuse and it can be the most flimsy excuses there, just simply saying it doesn't suit me today, I don't feel like it today, I, I just don't care to today. I don't have to talk about you guys or any one of you here in the sanctuary or listening. I know how easy to make excuses. And then afterwards, how many times have we felt badly? We felt just terribly inside knowing we could have and should have served in some way, but we procrastinated. We said, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it another day. It's too much work today. And then we get got busy with our own activities again and therefore missed the whole opportunity of serving. It's not that perhaps didn't want to, or we didn't love the person, we just didn't make an effort. We didn't give it the E for effort. James 4.17 spells it out very clearly. Therefore to him who knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. When you know to do good and you see the need and you don't do it, it is sin. We need, to, we need to constantly remind ourselves that this life is not about us. It's not about our own pleasures. It's not about our own work and our work. It's not about school or education. It's about what is important to us. What do we find is the most important to us? In Mark chapter 12, we find the two greatest commandments in Scripture. When 
he is talking to his disciples in verse 29, Mark 12, 29. Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And then he says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. So what does the first commandment even mean? It means a surrendered life to Christ, a servant-filled life, a servant-filled heart to Christ. The second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. These are two greatest commandments that we have in Scripture. And how well are we doing with them? Having the attitude of a servant will, pardon me, <clears throat> will totally change the way we view every relationship in our life. We will change the way we view our church, our family, and the church family for that, and for that reason, and that is why we belong to a local church. We belong, belong to a church because we believe and we love our God. Instead of focusing what we get out of relationships or what we get out of worship service, we need to focus on what, we, what we're putting into it. We need to focus on helping others. We need to focus on giving God all the honor and all the praise he is due. And we need to focus on exhorting or encouraging our brothers and our sisters, coming alongside them, blessing them, encouraging them, strengthening them. And that's something we can start today. We can start that immediately. I came across this little story. At age 16, Isaac Sandros took a job as a greeter at what is now Advent Help Sebring in Sebring, Florida. This young man, a greeter at a health center. One day, as he was at the doors greeting and so forth, he noticed a blind man waiting near the entrance. Along came the CEO of the hospital, Lenore. This Lenore, he approached the blind man and began to make conversation with him, keeping the man company while he waited for his ride to arrive. And when it was time for the blind man to go and his ride had arrived, this blind man asked Lenore, the CEO, what his role was at the hospital. What do you suppose Leo, Lenore replied? I am the CEO. I am chief executive officer of this hospital. I control all things around here. No, he simply said, I'm simply an employee. I just work here. This young Isaac is 16 years old, was struck by humility of his boss, his CEO of his boss's response. And the memory of that day stayed with him long after. Who are you when people ask you, who are you, what is your position, what do you do? Mark 3, Mark chapter 3. Thirteen. Jesus went up to a mountain. 
And he called unto him whom he would, and they came unto him. And it tells us he ordained 12 there in verse 14 that should be with him and that he might send them forth to preach, to have power to heal the sick, power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils. And Simon, he surnamed Peter, and James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, and he surnamed them for Erendus, which is sons of thunder. And Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Elphaz, and the Theodos, and Simon, and the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, which also betrayed him. They went into an house. And the multitude cometh together again, so that they could not so much as eat bread. Who were these men that Jesus called together to serve? Well, if we do a thorough study, and we don't have time for that this morning, sorry, but most certainly these disciples, my understanding, what I've learned, they were a very interesting bunch of boys, a bunch of men, I could say, to say the least. These were men like you and me. They had their ups and downs. What's important to note, though, out of all these men, when Jesus calls them to be his servants, they're all doing something. They're not just standing around, sitting around, hoping that one day Jesus will pick up his cell phone, text them and say, hey guys, what are you doing today? Could we go out for coffee? Yeah, could we just go hang out for a while? You know, just kind of be doing nothing. When Jesus called these men, there was none of that. In fact, there's no cell phones in Texas in that day. But Jesus called these men. What did they do? They left what they were doing. Some of them were fishermen. They left it follow Jesus. Some were tax collectors. They left their business, followed Jesus. The tax collector, of course, we know is Matthew. Then when Peter was called later on to this ministry, or Peter, pardon me, Peter did not, Peter was in ministry, yes, but Peter was also one of the disciples. What did he do? He failed miserably. He failed in a terrible way. He denied Jesus three times. And Jesus called him to walk on water, and he sank. But yet, one thing we have to give him credit for is that when he went to walk on water, he at least tried while the others didn't. But Peter, also we have to remember, became a great teacher. He became a great apostle. He became a great preacher. A faithful Christian servant, first of all, loves his heavenly father. He strives to follow Jesus. But that means then that he makes choices of what to do in his life. He chooses what Jesus would choose. He goes where Jesus would go. faithful Christian servant will be available to guide, direct, and teach and serve. A true servant will serve others. Proverbs 14, 25 to 27. A true witness delivers souls, but a deceitful witness speaketh lies. In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence, and his children shall have a place of refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, and to depart from the snares of death. Let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 12, 13 and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment 
with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. God is going to bring every work into judgment. And where is that judgment? Which judgment is it? There can be a few, but for the Christians, it's this one. 2 Corinthians 5.10 We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. For everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he has done, whether it be good or bad. Then I need to finish that up, that thought, and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Christ, Jesus Christ. Now if any man build on this, upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. <clears throat> if, any man, if any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burnt, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved as yet so as by fire. That is the judgment seat of Christ. Our works will be tried on the day of a rapture or after a rapture to see what our work's about. But then we also will see in Matthew chapter 25 who has been God's servants and who hasn't been God's servants. When you look at Matthew chapter 25, we have a number of parables in that chapter, or two, sorry, not a number, but two of them. Verses 1 to 13. We have the parable of the ten virgins. Then verses 14 to 30, we have the parable of the talents. <clears throat> and then in verses 31 to 46 is what I'm driving at. We have the separating of the nations as separating of sheep and goats. And if you read that through carefully, you will notice the ones that are being rewarded for the various things that they have done. When the, verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Before him shall be gathered all nations, shall separate them one from another as a sheep, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. And then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, you gave me meat. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was stranger, and you took me in. Naked, you clothed me. I was sick, you visited me. I was in prison, you came unto me. Then shall the glorious answer, sorry, then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer, and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it to one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. These are the servants of our Lord. They will see that great reward, that eternal home. Then let's continue reading for the ones that aren't his servants. And then shall he say unto them on his left hand, Depart me, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungered, ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, ye took me not in. Naked, ye clothed me not sick and in prison, and ye visit me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered, 
or a thirst or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister unto thee? And then, she, then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into the life eternal. You see the difference there between a servant and one who isn't serving, and one who isn't a servant? So what position do you hold today? Have you received Jesus Christ as your Lord Savior? And are you going to be his servant? Are you going to walk for him? Or are you still on the side? I, I will have nothing to do with that. That's, that's just hearsay, all that that you're reading. I don't need to listen to that stuff. The day is coming, my friends. We will all bow before Jesus Christ. The righteous and the unrighteous will all be bowing, no matter what we've done. The day and time has come, my friends. When, pardon me, <coughs> when when being a servant, don't think less of yourself, but think of yourself less. When being a servant, don't think less of yourself, but think of yourself less. Esteem others highly, not so much yourself. Don't worry about yourself. God will take care of you. As long as you take care of somebody else, I believe God will take care of you. What are you thinking of yourself? Father God, we want to thank you, Lord God, for the admonishment this morning. Thank you, Father, how you have spoken. Thank you, Father, that you are Lord and that you are God of all this creation, that you did so much for us on the cross of Calvary, that you became a servant for all mankind. And we thank you for that, Father. We thank you, Father, for the church. We thank you, Father, for Dennis and Barb this morning again taking up the leadership as care couple and father I pray God that you would just empower them and strengthen them again I pray God too that for John Peter's family I pray God that you undertake for that whole family when they're grieving the loss of a husband father and grandfather I pray God that you would just bring comfort to that family Bring them peace as only you can bring peace. And Father, if there's those two who are lost in that family, they would realize the brevity of life and that there's an eternity waiting for each and every one. I pray for our church family this morning. I know we have a church family that is great servants. And I want to pray, God, that you would just bless them, encourage them, and strengthen them. And I know, Father, that also there's those who are about themselves. And I pray, God, that you would touch their hearts and draw them unto thyself, Father, that they would surrender their lives to you and serve you, Father. And I pray, God, that as the time in this world is getting darker and darker, that we would now see it as the day and the time to start serving you, Lord God receiving you as our personal savior and walking in your footsteps. So Father, when that day of the rapture comes that we could all be together, raptured up into eternity, into that blissful home up in heaven. And Father God, we know we have family and friends that are lost and wandering in sin. Help us who are believers Help us who are servants to be a light and love to them, to walk alongside them, be an encouragement to them in a way that you, Lord God, can just come alongside, Father, and draw them unto thyself, Father. 
So we, Father, we, God, we pray for our nation. We pray for our governments. We pray, Lord God, that your will be accomplished through each one, through each leader. We know our parliament is in, in a turmoil right now. Father, we just pray, God, that you would have your will in this whole situation that's happening in our land and our country. So we pray, God, that you undertake in a mighty and a spe special way. We thank you, Father, how you have protected the church, how you have guarded the church to this day. And Father, I just pray, God, you continue to guide, guard, and direct us. We pray in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen. Thank you so much for your hearty singing this morning and the well-fitted songs that were sung this morning. What a blessing to hear the word through song. Uh, Corny just reminded me that uh, the annual meeting minutes did arrive, but upon checking, he found that there was a page missing in them. So he's pulled them off the shelf, so to say, and he's going to take them back and see where that one page went. So they should be here next Sunday then. I know the other churches all probably will have them. Don't feel bad that we're not getting them in the Mormon church. Mistakes do happen. We have to understand that. Was it computer error? Was it printer error? I don't know. But Corny will get it figured out. So, so just give him, just be a little patient. You'll get them. So thank you very much for being this morning. Thank you for supporting Barb and Dennis and, and then this commissioning service. Thank you for your prayers. And I'll do the benediction and then We'll, as ministerial and Barb and Dennis will go out first this morning and the ushers can come forward and usher you out and you can wish them, give them well wishes, greetings, and so forth, whatever is on your heart at the time. Benediction out of numbers this morning, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen. So we're dismissed. And may God go with each one of you. Have a blessed week. Remember, a cup of cold water will not go unrewarded. Mm -hmm.